and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share it with you. I want you to take the Word of God and open it with me to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, if you will, to Revelation chapter number 5. And we're going to read a few verses together in just a moment. I want to speak to you tonight on everybody's question. It is everybody's question. Now, everybody doesn't verbalize it, but everybody thinks it. And here's the question, why? Why? We preach hard about what people ought to do with their lives and we talk about where they ought to go and who they ought to marry and what they ought to do and what they ought not to do. And in the back of all of our minds is this nagging question, why? You see, motive truly does matter. It's one thing to say to people very early on, you do this because it's right, you do this because I said so, but at some point you have to get to a higher motive. At some point... You have to get to Jesus. And the way to do that is to go all the way to the end and work backwards. I'm looking at a lot of young people tonight, junior campers and teen campers, and we're going to have a great couple days together the rest of this week. And I'm thinking about my life at your stage in life, and uh, frankly, I had lots of thoughts going through my mind, and one of them was why. God called me to preach as a teenager, and I had a lot of people ask me why. <laughs> Why not wait till you turn 18? Why not wait to go off to college somewhere? I had some struggles and I had some personal challenges to deal with, some temptations. We preach about purity and holiness and we should, but why? Joseph, why did you not do the wrong thing with Potiphar's wife? Daniel, why did you purpose not to defile yourself? Peter, why did you suffer such persecution? Paul, why did you let them beat you and stone you and leave you for dead and spend a night and a day in the deep? Why did you go through all of that? And John, why did you end up on the Isle of Patmos? And why sit on that lonely rocky island all by yourself? Why? When you come to Revelation chapter 5, we find the answer. And the answer tonight is a very simple one. But it's the greatest one I know to give you. Would you read with me? Look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Pause just a moment, would you please? God has lots of books. You're holding one of them in your hand tonight. Would you hold it up in the air just a moment? This is not man's book. This is God's book. It is God's message to man, and it's perfect. He has a book called The Lamb's Book of Life. You've never seen it, but you will someday. Because if you're saved, your name is written in that book. And if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, your name is not there. And only those found written in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to enter into heaven someday. As a matter of fact, God's got quite a library there. Not just the Lamb's Book of Life. The Bible says on the day of judgment that the books, plural, were open and men were judged out of those books. You see, look please, you might forget certain things, but God keeps very good records. And the book in Revelation chapter 5 is a unique book. It's a book that reveals the future of the world. As a matter of fact, these seven seals in the, in the chapters that follow are seven different judgments that God is going to pour out. And you know, there's a lot of intrigue about the book of Revelation and there's a lot of interest about end time things and people will know who is the Antichrist and, and when is this going to happen and what's the next event on God's agenda. But I want to remind you, the Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy and Revelation is not about things, it's all about Jesus. It's interesting, but the first thing John sees is not all the things that are written in the book. The first he, thing he sees is the only one who's worthy to open it. And before I read on, would you look me in the eye just a moment? It's interesting to me that this book is all about the future. How many of you are interested in the future? Not just the future of this world, the future of your life. Hear me please. There's only one person that is able to make sure that your future turns out exactly like it ought to. And his name is Jesus. The Bible says in verse number two, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, 
nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. For the record, that's 100 million. And then, to let you know, that's not an exact number. It's a number no man can number. He adds, and thousands of thousands. <laughs> this is an amazing crowd on a Wednesday night. I'm glad you're here to worship God. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a worship service that's going to assemble someday around the throne of the Lamb of the tribe of Judah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Nobody's ever been in a service quite like that before. And there's not a rock band on earth that can attract that kind of crowd. There's not a dictator on earth that has anything to say worth hearing. But on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the choir was wonderful tonight and the special music was amazing. But you've never heard a choir like that and you've never heard a song like they're going to sing. And by the way, we're going to be in the choir. Aren't you looking forward to that day when even people like me get to sing and nobody complains about it? And what will the hymn be? Oh, look at verse 12 saying, With a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. You ever have one of those moments, deja vu, they say it is. You ever have one of those moments where you think, I've been here before? How many of you ever have one of those moments? It's spooky, isn't it? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have one of those moments someday because what we just read in Revelation chapter 5, you're not only going to witness it, you're going to experience it. You're going to be right in the middle of it someday and you're going to think, I've been here before somewhere, yes, on the pages of Holy Scripture. Because in Revelation chapter 5, all of us who know and love the Lord are going to be there. And what a day that's going to be. You ever hear somebody say, someday it will all make sense? Well, this is the day. And the beautiful thing is you don't have to wait for someday for it to make sense. You know, it's an interesting crowd tonight because we've got junior age campers and we've got teenage campers and then we've got lots of just faithful church members and folks visiting and it's wonderful. And somebody says, well, you know, you need to try to speak to everybody. Look, there is one message that speaks to everybody and his name is Jesus. The best homiletics lesson I ever received, I received as a 13-year-old boy I was going somewhere to preach in a youth rally or something and I was struggling trying to figure out what I was going to preach on. My dad came into the room and he had not been preaching very long himself and he said, what's wrong? I said, I'm trying to figure out what to preach and I've got these different sermons. And my dad sat me down and he said something to me I've never forgotten. He said, son, when you don't know what to preach, just preach Jesus. And then he stopped and said, and by the way, when you think you know what to preach, just preach Jesus. 
May I say to you, there is no message like the message of Jesus Christ. Do you know why you're here tonight? Somebody says, yes, because of camp or because of this church. No, you are here tonight because of Jesus Christ. Do you know why we call each other brothers and sisters? Because of Jesus Christ. Why should a new believer follow Christ in baptism? Why? Why read your Bible and pray every day? Why attend church faithfully? Why witness to somebody? Why yield your life to God? I thought, frankly, that at some point in my life, that question would go away. May I say to you, that question never goes away. Because at every stage and at every season in life, there are temptations and there are struggles and there are trials. And let me ask you, some of you have been saved longer than I've been alive. Why are you still here faithful to God? Why are you faithful to your spouse? And why are you still trying to pass something on to the next generation? Why have you pressed through when you've had so much adversity in your own life? There remains but one reason that is a worthy answer, and that is because of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, but there's lots of things revealed in Revelation. John saw a revelation of heaven. How many of you would like to get a little glimpse of heaven? Wow. Someday you're going to get more than a little glimpse. Aren't you looking forward to that? You're going to take the grand tour and then you're going to spend forever there. But that wasn't the revelation that shook John to the core. Oh, he talks about it. On the other hand, there's the revelation of hell. And someone once said, if God for 30 seconds would roll back hell and let us see the fire and let us see the torments of the damned, our lives would never be the same. And I think there's no doubt about that. And yet it's interesting in the revelation, it was not the revelation of hell that shook John to the core. Rather, the revelation that caused John to stand in total awe and to fall on his face and act like a dead man was the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes when we're trying to, to get people to do the right thing, we're telling them to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. We're saying, do the right thing because here's the reward you get. <laughs> Listen to me, friend. The reward is not heaven. The reward is him. The reward is not a crown someday. The reward is Christ himself. We've missed the point at times by even warning people about judgment and about things to come and missing this. Can I tell you what hell is? Hell is separation from God forever. It's missing Jesus. And it's sad that people live and die without Christ, but it's worse still that Judas has been there 2,000 years without him and will be there for the rest of eternity without him. Hear me, please. It is not just about heaven and hell. It is all about him and the message of the Bible and the entire Christian life is wrapped up in who Jesus Christ is. And sometimes those of us who've been saved a while think we know a lot of Bible. We need to go back to what Paul called the simplicity that is in Christ. And that's what we're brought to in Revelation chapter 5. And there's lots of details in Revelation 5 I wish I had time to talk to you about. Study it for yourself. But I want to give you three simple observations tonight and they're all about Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to help me. I'm going to ask you to help me preach tonight. Now some of you have preached sermons before and that's very good. I think everybody ought to have preached one sermon in their life just to stand on a platform and look at what preachers have to look at all the time. It would change the way you listen to a sermon, I promise you that. But I'm going to give you these three simple observations tonight and I want you to help me preach them because I'm praying the Spirit of God will put them deeply in your heart and when we're done, we're going to do something with them. Here's the first. Would you write it down somewhere? What does John tell us about Jesus in Revelation chapter 5? The first thing he tells us is that Jesus is wonderful. Simple, isn't it? Jesus is wonderful. Would you look, please, at verse number three? The Bible says they're looking for somebody who can open the book, somebody who is able to loose the seals thereof. Look at verse three, and no man. And then he says, no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open, open the book, neither to look thereon. And then he says, again in verse four, I wept much because, look at it again, no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And I've marked in my Bible, no man. We're living in a world that's enamored with men. We live in a selfie society. We live in an Instagram world. We live in a world of people who get totally taken with personality. And sometimes 
people look at an athlete because he can dunk a ball or because he can throw a ball or because he can hit a ball. And they say, he's wonderful. Look at me, please. No man is wonderful. Only Jesus is wonderful. Amen. We hear a singer and we say, oh, she's a wonderful musician. And sometimes even in spiritual circles, we hear a preacher and we say, oh, he's a wonderful preacher. Listen to me. We are all one thing. We are all black-hearted, hell-deserving sinners in desperate need of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And there is only one person on earth that is worthy of being called wonderful and his name is Jesus. You know what the word wonderful means? It literally, it literally means full of wonder. And I'd like to ask you tonight, when was the last time you got a glimpse of Jesus? When was the last time you stood in awe of who Christ was? A few months ago, I was in a youth conference in Canada and we were having a good meeting. It was a good meeting, but there's a difference between a good meeting and a meeting where the Lord really gets seen and known. On Friday night, to be honest with you, I was a little tired and truthfully didn't feel a whole lot like preaching. And sitting in that meeting, they started singing, hundreds of Canadian young people, they started singing without any music. And peace like a river attendeth my way. And sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And with every verse that they sang, it was as if the sweet spirit of God descended even greater, more fully upon us. Until when all was said and done, nobody remembered the special music. Nobody remembered the sermon. And at 10.30 that night, I stood in the back of that auditorium next to a young Canadian pastor and it was still going on. And we weren't standing at the front. On this side of the auditorium, there was a group of young people down on their faces weeping and praying. On this side of the auditorium, there was a, a group of kids still sitting in the pews. I mean, 10.30 at night. There were activities going on. They, they weren't at the activities. Sitting there just talking about the Lord and what it meant to them. On the, on the platform, there was an impromptu choir that got up and started singing. A group of Filipino young people just singing at the top of their lungs. And this Canadian pastor said to me, Brother Scott, this doesn't happen in Canada. And I said to him, friend, this doesn't happen anywhere until Jesus is seen. Amen. And see, that's why Christ said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me. And I want to say to you tonight, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, Jesus is a wonderful Savior. And I want to say to some of you that are saved, but you've never really yielded your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Jesus is a wonderful Master. Satan is a slave driver and sin will hold you in bondage. Oh, but Jesus is a wonderful Lord and master. Jesus is wonderful. He's the wonderful lamb. Would you look at him? You look at the picture in verse number six. He's a lamb as it had been slain. We see him at Calvary having seven horns. That's his strength and seven eyes. He's everywhere. He sees everything. Stop, look at me just a minute. Jesus is looking at you right now, my friend. In all the earth, his eyes run to and fro. He's looking deeper than I can look. He sees what your friends cannot see. He knows what your youth director does not know. His eyes are everywhere. The Spirit of God has his eye on you at this moment. He's a wonderful lamb. But he's not just the wonderful lamb. Back up, please, to verse number five. He's the wonderful lion. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. I've marked in verse 6 the word slain, and in verse 5 the word prevailed. I don't know about you. I've been to Calvary, and I thank God for the cross, but I give God the glory tonight that that was not the end of the story. Look, on that mountain, the lamb uttered not a word, but when Jesus Christ came out of that grave alive forevermore, the lion roared. And Jesus Christ tonight is wonderful. What's his first name? Jesus' first name. Someone says, Jesus is his name. That's his earthly name. Someone else says, well, he is Jesus Christ. That's right. He is the anointed one. He is Messiah. Oh, that's his title. That's who he is. And someone else says, well, his full title is Lord Jesus Christ. Correct. What's his first name? 
Would you permit Isaiah to answer that question? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, what church? Wonderful. Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Look, the first thing he is called is, he is wonderful. And some of you are weighing it tonight on the scales of your mind, trying to figure out if you're really going to live for God or not. Listen to me. This life apart from Jesus is miserable. But with Christ, it's wonderful. There's a second truth I want to give you tonight, and it is this. Not only is it true that Jesus is wonderful, but would you write it down? Jesus is worthy. Now, once you write that down, I want us to review. I said I was going to have you help me preach, so here we go. I want you to say the first one with me. Number one, Jesus is what? Let's try that one again. Jesus is what? Wonderful. Say it like you mean it. Jesus is? Wonderful. He's wonderful. Number two, Jesus is what? Worthy. When God repeats something, it's for emphasis. Would you look at it? When I stop, you say the next word. Look at verse two. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is? Worthy. Look at verse four. And I wept much because no man was found. Worthy. Look at verse nine. And they sung a new song saying, thou art. Worthy. Look at verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, Sounds to me like God wants us to know Jesus is worthy. And immediately someone says, worthy of what? You ready for the answer? Yes. He's worthy of everything. As a matter of fact, look at the list in verse number 12. He is worthy of power and worthy of riches and worthy of wisdom and worthy of strength and worthy of honor and worthy of glory and worthy of blessing. Now look at that list just a minute. Do you know what we have? We have measures of that. You're healthy tonight. You had strength to be in church. God gave you strength. You have certain honor that God may put upon your life. You have blessing, and we pray for blessings every day. But hear me, please. All of those things that come into my life are mine because of grace and mercy. I do not deserve any of them, but Jesus deserves all of them. I may have some riches that pass through my hand, but it's not because I deserve it. It's because God gives power to get wealth. But Jesus is worthy of all riches because he is the creator of all things. Jesus is worthy of everything. And I want to say to every person in this room tonight, Jesus is worthy of you. He's worthy of you. May I ask you a personal question? What is Jesus worth? to you. For Judas, it was a few pieces of silver. What is Jesus worth to you? May I tell you where I deserve to be tonight? I deserve to be in hell right now. But I'm not there. And not only am I not there, praise God, I'm never going there. And it's not because I'm worthy to go to heaven. It's because Jesus is the worthy one. And every good thing in my life is mine because of Jesus. Do you understand? Everything is because of Jesus. Christ is everything. I don't have a life without Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon was scheduled to preach one night in a church. He arrived late. The place was packed and jammed and he couldn't get into the building. There were so many people. He went around to the back and he found a side door, an entrance where a man was standing post, not letting anyone else in, an uh, overflow crowd. And he saw Mr. Spurgeon. Oh, Mr. Spurgeon, right this way. As Spurgeon started to go into the building, he noticed a little boy, a lad, down on the ground weeping, just kind of a, a street boy with face dirty and tears streaming down his face, hair disheveled, clothes a mess. And he said, son, what's the matter? And the young man looked up and said, did you know that the greatest preacher in the world is preaching in there tonight? Spurgeon smiled and said, is that right? He said, yes, sir, and I can't get in. He said, I've been to every door, and at every door they turn me away. They said, no admittance here, no more room for boys tonight, no more place for you. Mr. Spurgeon stood up and straightened himself, and he said, well, I'm going in. The boy's eyes got big. He said, you think you can? He said, I think I can. Mr. Spurgeon said to this young English boy, he said, would you like to go in with me? And the little boy said, you think it'll work? He said, I think it will work. He said, grab a hold of my pant leg. Hold on for dear life, and everywhere I go, you go, you're with me. 
Spurgeon started walking towards the side door and immediately the man opened the door and the two of them walked right through that door that the boy had been rebuffed at a moment ago and into that huge crowd. It was like the parting of the Red Sea as Spurgeon made his way to the lectern and he sat down on the platform and there was an empty seat next to him and he put that little boy right in the seat next to him. Oh, that kid had never been anywhere like that before. He'd never seen a crowd like that. He sat there in awe for a few moments and then after several moments of silence, he said, sir, this is amazing. Thank you so much. But I do have one question. Where is Mr. Spurgeon? And Charles Spurgeon said, I'm Mr. Spurgeon and tonight you're my honored guest. And you're going to sit right here with me. When I read that story, the Spirit of God said, that was you. I was that dirty little boy that tried every door, that tried every way in, that tried every means of admission to a holy God. And at every place they said, no room for people like you here. Sorry, can't come in here. No way in this way. And then one day, oh, blessed be the day of my salvation, Jesus came to me and said, I'm going in. Would you like to go in with me? And on that day I became one with Jesus Christ, not because I'm worthy, but because he is worthy. And he brings us into the presence of God. Revelation 5 is the throne room of a holy God and you only get there through Jesus. And I was meditating on this passage the other day and I noticed something. Did you know there's only two earthly things that will be there? And both of them are mentioned in Revelation 5. There's only two things on this earth in your life that will be in that throne room. Number one, eternal souls will be there. The souls of those who've been redeemed out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. We're represented, look at verse number eight, by the 24 elders. That's a picture of the church. We will be there. And something else will be there. The prayers of the saints will be there. Look at what the Bible says in verse number eight. They bring out golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. You know, some of you have been talking to God about something and you think your prayers are hitting the ceiling. You think they're not getting through. You think God's forgotten where you are. I want to tell you tonight that the God who loves us so much, he puts all of our tears in a bottle, has his eye on you, and your prayers are going to outlive you. You're going to meet him at the throne of God. They at this moment are in the presence of a holy God who is able to hear and answer our prayers. And as incense rose up off the altar into the presence of God, your prayers are being heard tonight. You young people, listen to me. It's not just the prayers of the pastor or your parents that God is listening to. God is listening to your prayers. And Jesus is worthy of your life. He's worthy of you giving your life to reach others with the gospel. David Brainerd, days before he died, there's a picture of him in the Christian Heritage Center Every time I see it, I think about his life. He, he died as a very young man, coughing up blood, riding on horseback to Indian villages, telling him about Jesus Christ. And days before he died, David Brainerd wrote to his brother these words. I declare now I am dying. I would not have spent my life otherwise for the whole world. <laughs> There's nothing in the world worth living for. But doing good and finishing God's work, doing the work that Christ did. I see nothing else in the world that can yield any satisfaction besides living to God, pleasing Him, and doing His whole will. The Browns sang a beautiful song about being in the center of God's will a while ago. Hear me please. That doesn't just matter here, that matters there. As a matter of fact, on that day, it's really going to matter there. When I was a kid, I thought God had assigned an angel to me with a video camera and he followed me around everywhere I went and videotaped every bad thing I'd ever done. And I had this scary notion that when I stood before God someday, this giant screen was going to fall down out of the sky and God was going to replay every bad thing. Everybody was going to see it and I was going to be very embarrassed. Some of you thought the same thing. I grew up and started studying the Bible and found out that's not true at all. It's much worse than that. On the day you stand before God, it's not going to be you and everybody else. On the day you stand before God, you're going to stand face to face with the lamb and the lion. And on that day, you're going to give an account of what you did with your life. And I'm just going to tell you, when you kneel at nail-pierced feet, you're going to realize he was worthy of everything. Why do we give him so little? Why do we limit our God? Why do we hold back so much when Jesus Christ gave everything for us? 
Jesus is wonderful and only Jesus. Jesus is worthy. Here's the third principle. Would you write it down? Jesus is to be worshipped. It's the last picture of Revelation 5 and it's the lasting privilege of our life. What do you think you're going to do for all eternity? Would you look at verse number 14? The four beasts said amen. And the four and twenty elders, remember that's us, fell down, mark this, and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And this may not sound very youthy, but I'm just going to say to all the young people tonight, the greatest thing you can give your life to is worshiping Jesus. And by the way, when you get this question answered, when you answer the why, it'll straighten out everything else. All those struggles, all that internal turmoil trying to weigh out, is it really worth it? Look, in light of Jesus, it is all worth it. Because someday we're all going to do one thing. We're going to worship Christ. And you know what worship is? Somebody says, oh yes, we worship when we play an instrument or we, we worship when we sing a song or we worship when we listen to the preacher preach or we worship with the offering. And while we may worship, while we do all of those things, worship is not limited to that. In fact, I would submit to you that that is not the greatest form of worship. I want you to go back with me to Romans chapter 12 for just a minute, would you please? And I'll finish here. We like to preach this passage, and it's a great passage. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. You know it. You could quote it with me. Now look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And to be honest with you, I'd like to preach tonight on yielding your body to Jesus and renewing your mind and then doing the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. But I'm not preaching on that. I'm preaching on why. Why give your body to him? When everybody else is piercing theirs, why give your body to him? When everybody else is marking theirs, why give your body to Jesus? When everybody else is doing sexually anything they want to do because it feels good, why give your body as a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ? While everybody else is feeding their mind on lots of junk and nastiness, why give your mind to God and try to be a spiritual young person? Why do that? And while others are going to make money and live in big houses and drive fancy cars and be well known, why, why waste your life doing something that nobody's ever going to notice? Well, the answer is found in the verses before the verses we just read. Would you back up to chapter 11? And verse 33 says, oh, whew, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? You think God's going to be your debtor? You really think God owes you? Look at verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever, amen. I beseech you therefore, brethren. And I want to tell you, if you get the why right, the what will make more sense. And if you could get, look at me, just a glimpse of Jesus, it would change everything. How does a guy go from persecuting the church to being persecuted because on the road to Damascus he got a glimpse of Jesus Christ in all of his glory? And John, how do you go to the Isle of Patmos in despair and come back with joy because on that island he met Jesus? No wonder the hymn writer wrote, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is worthy. And Jesus alone is to be worshipped. Do you know what the greatest form of worship is? A surrendered life. The greatest act 
of worship is not coming to church. The greatest act of worship is coming to Jesus and saying, I'm all yours. And a kid stood in an art gallery in Germany, just meandering through the art and admiring the paintings. And he came to one. It was an artist rendering of Calvary. And no artist can picture what happened at the cross, but it captured his attention. And for a moment, he stood there looking at the man in the middle. And he turned to walk away. And when he did, a little plaque under the painting grabbed his attention. And he read these words, All this have I done for thee. What hast thou done for me? And a young man by the name of Zinzendorf went home and got down beside his bed and said to Jesus, I've never done anything for you. You've done it all. And the least I can do is give you my life. He went to the school where he attended and he started a prayer group. That's it, just a prayer group at his school. And the prayer group grew into one of the mightiest missionary movements that has ever existed on this planet, now known as the Moravian Missionary Movement. And one day, two young men who were Moravians heard of an island of the sea that had never heard of Jesus. And they said, we're going to go. We're going to go as missionaries. And then they found out to their utter dismay that no outsiders ever entered that island except for slaves. They were the only ones and it was the only way. And two young single men sold themselves into slavery so that people who had never heard the name of Jesus could know he was wonderful. And on the morning they departed and walked the plank to the ship and their friends came out weeping and waving goodbye knowing they would never see them again. The two young men turned around and one of them pointed to heaven and spoke these words, May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And I want to tell you tonight, you don't deserve anything but hell. Nor do I. But Jesus, he deserves it all.